Welcome, everybody. Welcome to episode number 67 of Fraternity Foodie. My name is Mike Ayalon. I am the CEO of Greek University. We call these episodes Fraternity Foodie because there is nothing like great food to bring people together. Buckle up because we have an incredible guest with us today. You are not going to want to miss this. Dr. Jason L. Merriweather is an experienced higher education leader with over two decades of service to public and private universities, including nine years of HBCU service. In his roles as vice president, Jason has been responsible for enrollment management, academic support, NCAA and NAIA athletics, and student affairs. Jason has published on topics such as adult learning, student retention, digital learning and engagement, student affairs fundraising, and hazing prevention. And we are gonna be talking about his latest book. Jason is the editor of Dismantling Hazing and Greek Letter Organizations, Effective Practices for Prevention, Response, and Campus Engagement. A native of Guthrie, Kentucky, Jason earned his Bachelor of Arts degree in communication from the University of Louisville. He earned the Master of Arts degree in Psychology from Fisk University right here in Nashville, Tennessee, and was selected for the inaugural Academic Leadership Academy at the Pennsylvania State University Center for the Study of Higher Education, which he completed in 2011, earning a certificate. Jason also earned the PhD in Educational Administration with a specialization in Higher Education Leadership from Indiana State University. His dissertation was titled, The Impact of Hazing Rituals on the Intent to Report, Examining the Perceptions and Beliefs of Undergraduate Students in Greek Letter Organizations. Jason currently serves Humboldt State University, a public comprehensive four-year Hispanic serving institution with a population of 6,000 undergraduate and graduate students with 61 undergraduate and graduate programs as their Vice President of Enrollment Management. Welcome to the show, Jason. Glad to be here. Thank you for having me. And oh, I sound busy. Listen to that thing. <laughs> <laughs> you are very busy. And I'm honored that you're coming on the show because honestly, our listeners have so much to learn from everything that you've been working on. So I just, I can't wait to get to this interview, to be honest with you. I've been looking forward to this all week. Um, so let's talk a little bit about your background. I know you went to the University of Louisville for your undergraduate experience. Why did you choose Louisville? Uh, you know, it was an amazing institution. Uh, Louisville is a great community, um, awesome people and mentors, many faculty that I'm still in touch with to this day. Um, I will, we'll talk a little bit more about one of my mentors, Ricky Jones, uh, when we get into the book. And, uh, we'll, you know, but all in all, just the experience, the connections. And when I visited there, I actually had no intention of going to Louisville and ended up getting a, a full academic scholarship and just the experience on campus was amazing. They had this program um, called Beamers, Black Male Rap Session. And so it was really neat because for this Beamers program, uh, it was the, I was like, tell me about Beamers. It's all, oh, you know, the brothers, the brothers just get together, you know, every other Friday and just talk about issues. We're like what? So whatever's going on, it's just a support group. And all the other schools I've visited had nothing like that. And just the, the, the facilities, the experience, and obviously the rich athletic history um, all played a factor. But it was a great place and wouldn't have shows. There's nowhere else I could have got a better degree, I'm convinced. I love it. You also spent a large portion of your professional career at Fisk University here in Nashville. You got your master's mm -hmm. degree there, and then you worked your way up. Uh, to Dean of Students and eventually Vice President of Enrollment Management and Student Education. So mm -hmm. what makes Fisk University such a special place for you? Uh, Fisk is special uh, to me for about three reasons. One, so my wife and I actually both did our master's degrees there. And my wife is a graduate of the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. Mm -hmm. And we both, as much as we loved our amazing experiences, you know, she was there when they won the championship in 98 in football. Uh, obviously, Louisville was always dominant in basketball and just amazing experiences. But we always had this little itch in the back of our mind, like, wow, you know, we, we didn't get the HBCU experience. And so working at Fisk, uh, spending 10 years there, and both of us getting our grad degrees there really did something special. And so um, that was an important part of the experience as well. And 
So the other thing to keep in mind when we think about the Fisk experience is that as you look at everything that's happening in society right now, particularly in this country around race, for 10 years of my career, talking about blackness wasn't a problem. Mm. You, you didn't have to explain anyone, to anyone uh, that, that you, know, you don't always look at students of color from a deficit model. Um, it's just amazing and enriching academic experience, incredibly talented students. Uh, you know, they're, they're, it's just amazing being in that place and in that space. And then the third thing is that we graduated such incredible students uh, from everywhere. We recruited uh, nationally, internationally. We brought great people there who came, earned a degree. And, you know, it's just amazing. I go on LinkedIn or Facebook sometimes. and I look at the students from Fisk and what they're doing now. It's just incredible. You know, so, you know, just to be a small cog in, in, in the great historic will that is Fisk University to help students for a few years, um, it was absolutely amazing to me. And uh, Greek life, I, I learned a lot about Greek life there and, and the, the, the positives that can happen with fraternity and sorority life on that campus. Greek life really led the way uh, for student leadership on that campus. Uh, they were the hub of activities, of community service. Uh, we did a lot of great work. I think in my bio, uh, I think um, now I'm somewhere around 15,000 hours of community service projects that I've overseen in my career for fraternities and sororities. Like 10,000 of them were at Fisk, you know? Um, it was just amazing the heart for service that the, those students had really modeled. You know, we had a couple things that happened. There, there were some things that happened and, you know, but the good news is one of my favorite stories of seeing a chapter get in trouble come back, resurrect itself, and take a real leadership role academically um, on the other side of a hazing issue. I saw that at Fisk, and, and honestly, that's the only place I've ever really seen it happen that way. So it's really special for me. And so some of the hope that I have for what can happen with fraternities and sororities in the future is really rooted in my experiences at Fisk. Yeah. There's so many learning opportunities in fraternity and sorority life. And I think that's why you and I are both so passionate about Greek life is because we know that. And even taking a negative such as this hazing uh, experience that you're talking about at Fisk and turning that into a positive, that's a learning experience. And so I really hope that administrators are looking at things like that as learning experiences. Can we possibly turn this thing around and use that um, to move forward in a better way? And uh, so that's really important that you shared that and I'm glad you had such a good experience there at Fisk. Um, so after earning your PhD at Indiana State and then doing some work in enrollment management and student success, now you're on the mm -hmm. West Coast as Vice President of Enrollment Management at Humboldt State University. So here I, I gather you're responsible for access, retention, and completion. So what are some of the initiatives that your team has implemented at Humboldt State and you've actually had some success with? Oh, wow, it's been a crazy, wild and fast first year. Tomorrow is actually the 15th. Um, I don't know when this is gonna air, but we're recording it today. Yeah. So uh, on, on July 15th, that's my one year anniversary of being at Humboldt. Uh, came with a great president and Tom Jackson. I uh, have a fabulous leadership team. And a lot of the team that I have at Humboldt are people that were already there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've brought in a couple of amazing new students and hired a couple of folks, but in reality, the, the, the nexus of my team are people who've been at La Humboldt, who are committed to it, who are loyal to it. So we put in this new initiative, for example, to recruit local students. And um, Humboldt had really seen a, a, a dwindling over the last five or six years and local students uh, choosing to leave instead of stay and go to school. You know how it is, you look at your local school and say, hey, that's like 13th grade, you know? And <laughs> so we, we really had to turn that around. And so we've, we've spent this year, I'll give you an example. Last year we spent, we only had 32 uh, local high school students attend Humboldt. So we put in this new scholarship initiative called Humboldt First for local students. We went around to all the local high schools and every student who qualified for admission, we automatically admitted them right, up, right off the top. We worked with the counselors, got their transcripts, admitted them. And then we gave them a $4,000 scholarship, $1,000 a year to help with the cost of tuition. Our tuition price point is only around $6,000. So it's really a, a big lift. And then 66% of our students uh, who are full Pell eligible or what have you don't pay tuition. And so it's really important that we um, 
support those students and the, the scholarship helps us do that. So as of right now, we've had over 200 students accept the scholarship. Obviously there's this little disruption called COVID-19 that's uh, been a little harmful uh, to a lot of universities in terms of our um, recruitment and students uh, desires to go to college. So we'll see how it shakes out. But you know, the jump from 32, even if we get 100 students, to accept that scholarship and go come in the fall, it'll be huge. Um, you know, we put in a lot of new technology. I've got a great uh, technology comms person, an awesome team in admissions and financial aid. We're doing a lot of creative stuff with our team and it's having a big impact pretty quickly on our ability to recruit students. Even with the hit that we've taken due to COVID, we're actually um, about 20% of the positive right now for transfer students. Wow. And we've done a lot of work in the last year to really hit transfer campuses, working with our faculty uh, to go and recruit, build bridges and MOUs. And so it's been really, really cool for us this year, um, seeing some of the creative things that we've done. It kept us from having to scramble when COVID hit. That's great. I absolutely love hearing that. And I can't wait to see what the future holds because I know you're going to continue to do amazing work over there. Uh, I'm also a huge fan of your new book. It's called Dismantling Hazing in Greek Letter Organizations. Everybody who's listening to this interview right now should go pick it up and read it if you haven't already. Uh, you and your colleagues, you. you offer some really new and innovative ideas on ending hazing. And I think we should talk about Ricky Jones, a professor at the University of Louisville, mm -hmm. who in the book, he had admits that he and his contemporaries were unsuccessful in stopping hazing. So do you think it's realistic to think that this book is going to help us end hazing? And if so, what's different now? So I appreciate that question and can't wait to dive in. So first and foremost, I have to be clear of the shoulders that I'm standing on. So Ricky Jones is really one of the preeminent scholars in hazing. Uh, when I was an undergrad and I was a student, he was working on his first book, Black Haze, which in 2004 was an epic game changer. It was the first book to look at hazing exclusively in fraternities and, and in the military. And so that book really opened up just creative uh, avenues for discussion and thought about how to eliminate this sort of hegemonic system that exists for hazing and fraternities in particular. And you have Walter Kimbrough, who, you know, and then uh, bro, you know, the chapter challenging presidents, who better to have that conversation with college presidents. And then, you know, in, his, in the four, Dr. Jones also talks about Larry Ross, who wrote the Divine Nine book. And so you've got shoulders like that. You've got others like Elizabeth Allen, who is, I, I think, the hazing researcher right now. Um, and she contributed to the book. And then just the fact that Hank Muir, who is like the, the, the godfather of this whole conversation, you know, and, and obviously, and then congratulations. I just saw that Hank joined Greek University. That's amazing. Yes. Yes. Um, but, but, but I mean, the, the fact that he wrote an endorsement for my book, you, you, you talking about having the ultimate fanboy marking out moment, right? So I want to acknowledge the shoulders that I stand upon to do this work. Yeah. Um, and at the end of the day, your question is poignant. So I'll be honest, I don't necessarily know that we're ever going to stop hazing, but I'm foolish enough to believe that it is critical and important and necessary to try. You know, we, we talked before the podcast that we're parents, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and our oldest three children are in college, mm -hmm. okay? So I have a son that's at Langston University. Um, I have another son that's at Indiana University. Uh, I have a daughter that's going to the University of Kentucky, okay? And in those three kids, so I have two chances to get somebody to Louisville. I got two left. So, but anyway, <laughs> I say that to say, for those kids that are in college who all have grown up on campus, going to service projects, you know, seeing the Greek stroll and step, seeing the, the, the collaborative program, seeing the philanthropy, they've grown up Greek. And, you know, I'm an active, a financially active member of AFIA, and it's important to be financially active. And as a member of Alpha, I've taught my kids that, you know, and even if my, my boys decide they want to, ugh, I can't even say it. Even my boys decide they want to do something else, I'm only paying for alpha, but, <laughs> but, but seriously, with that in mind, I want them to be safe. I want your kids 
to be safe Amen. when they go to college. I, 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 another person should not have to die. Another person should not have to be injured or hurt. You know, you, you look at the, the, the absolutely outrageous case of New Mexico State, where literally a, a member of Kappa Sigma shot a pledge in the leg during a loyalty oath. How insane is that? Yeah. You know, look, there, there were four deaths related to fraternity and sorority hazing in November of 2019 alone. So the question becomes, how many more people have to get hurt or die? And so in this book, I introduced this sort of paradigm of life versus tradition. And so what this conversation about is how many more people have to be hurt when I, when I go to campuses and, I, and I, I speak to students, and I've done a lot of work with athletics too, let's not leave them out because it's not all on the streets. Right. But when I, when I do this work, it is amazing how deeply seeked tradition are. So if we, as we examine and explore this idea of life versus tradition, what we're really talking about, Michael, is is it so important to you to hold up this concept of, oh, well, it happened to me, so I have to do it to someone else? Mm -hmm. Is it so important to you to put life at risk that, you know, my chapter legacy, my, the, the, this idea that in my chapter we do these brutal things, and if you don't do that, I can't respect you. Mm -hmm. Should those things really continue to outweigh life? And so a lot of what I talk about the universities almost is, how do you, how do you protect this, the university from these students who won't stop doing it, mm -hmm. who don't align with the values of our organizations? I'm still foolish enough to believe that, that fraternity and sorority life has an important place on college campuses, but not at the risk of another person dying or being hurt. And so that's what, what, what the collaborators and I endeavor to do throughout our book. There's a really neat chapter by Aaron Hart where he digs into the the confines and the secrecy within residential spaces and there's the and he had the hardest time putting together a lit review because not a lot of people are writing about what's happening in fraternity houses right. we'll report on the incidents after they happen but he introduces this really neat concept about education and that's really what it comes down to and so what we have to accomplish i think from our book is we have to put ourselves in a situation where more people try to ask the questions that invalidate the violent behavior and the prioritized life. And at the end of the day, if you won't make the decision to change your behaviors, then we have to question if you actually have a valid place on campus anymore. Yep, I agree 100%. I'm so grateful that you wrote this book. I really am. Um, and, uh, and it's funny because, you know, you mentioned Hank Neuer. I, uh, I was speaking on hazing prevention at NGLA, uh, and all of a sudden, you know, Hank Neuer and his wife walk in and they sit in the front row of my presentation. And I, at this point, I have never had a personal relationship with Hank. I've read his work just like you have for the last, you know, 20 years. And all of a sudden, he's sitting in the front row of one of my presentations on hazing prevention. Oh, yeah. And I'm uh -huh, geeking uh -huh. out. I'm like, oh, my God, because I know exactly who he is. And I know that mm -hmm, he's also mm -hmm. flown in from Poland in order to be there. And mm -hmm. I shake his hand and I introduce myself. And I said, Hank, I know who you are. And, and I tell him that in this presentation I'm about to give in the next five minutes to all these students, his name and his research is in my presentation. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I introduced it. him to all the students that were there. And I said, you know what? All of the students that are here today, you better go and take a selfie and meet this man, Hank <laughs> Muir, because all Absolutely. the work that I'm about to teach you is all based on his research. Exactly. <laughs> you know, it, it's funny. I had a similar uh, si situation where I was presenting at NASPA, oh gosh, maybe six or seven years ago about hazing. Mm -hmm. And as I'm presenting on, obviously, the, the seminal 2008 Allen and Madden study. So, you know, it's, it's all in my framework. And, and we'll talk about the, the hidden harms and the issues of uh, people not understanding that the, the risk 
skin dangers of hazing that, that their work really introduced and so I'm presenting this and then Alan was in the room. She was, you know, she was in the room. So afterwards she comes up to me and I'm like, yo, can I can you like autograph my notes? <laughs> you know? <laughs> like I meant like she laughs to this day. I say, you're like the Jay-Z of the hazing game. <laughs> you know? If Hank Newer is Ice Cube, Elizabeth Allen is Jay-Z, right? That's and so right. that's the that's the way you 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 look at this in, in terms of those legends and, and their work. And so it, it, as we endeavor to to do this, having the endorsement of that of a scholar and a leader is super huge. Um, and so we've been in a situation where we're blessed to be able to do the work that we do. Right. And having their endorsement and their support means the world to me. Um, you know, and, and when he did the endorsement, I wrote him a letter. Like, like a little, like, printed out, sign it with blue ink, like, mail it to his house and all this letter. Because I'm like, this is Hank Newark, you know, and I'm still amazed by that. But those foundations are important and we can't ignore them. Um, I, I think we can only continue to build upon those, um, those thoughts. I agree. And I'm glad that we still have him, that he's here and participating and we get to capture his words on tape so that way future generations can hear it directly from him. I think it's so mm -hmm. important. Um, as a former executive director of a major fraternity, I know that my budget was increasingly made up of liability insurance. It was a huge part of my budget. And your chapter, it's called From Classrooms to Courtrooms, notes that fraternities are paying nearly $30 million annually to settle hazing-related lawsuits, which is an increase of over $20 million annually six to eight years ago. A lot of people probably don't know that and realize just how much that jump really was. So why are students today still unaware of the risks associated with hazing or even the definition of hazing itself? Wow, that's deep. Um, there are a couple of reasons. Uh, the first reason is a lot of current members lie to students about what is or is not and what the risk is to them. Speaking deeply into Elizabeth Allen's work, this is where they began to unpack that most, there are a number of students who simply don't understand that hazing is hazing, or in particular, they don't think that the risk or harms are going to impact them. Mm -hmm. And so if you're unsure and you turn to the current members of the organizations to ask them, is this dangerous? And they say, oh, well, I went through it. You can go through it and it's okay. That's where the lie begins. Mm -hmm. So one of my big, big important recommendations is that universities have to be more willing to talk about hazing earlier and sooner. That's super important. And so for them to be able to be effective, um, I think that what we have to do, them being universities, is start talking about it as early as orientation. So it's important that you pay the bill. It's important that you register for class. But it's also critically important that we put ourselves in a position as university leaders that we are the first ones talking about the risks the dangers and the hidden harms. And because universities are often unwilling to have that early conversation, well, if you wait until September or October to have a hazing conversation, well, by Hazing Prevention Week, the damage has been done. Mm. The members have made the connections. The members are orientation leaders, they're RAs, they're, they're student government leaders, they're out on campus in their letters, and they've already made the connections and begun to have the dishonest conversations. Mm -hmm. So universities really have to take on the work early and often to talk about hazing and the real risk and dangers that exist for students. We have to do that. The other thing that happens is there's this romanticized view of fraternity and sorority life that yes, there are connections, there are, there are jobs, there are all these things, but I also say, I don't know a frat brother yet that's paid my rent for me. <laughs> but this looming idea of, oh, well, if I'm in and I just go through this, I'm gonna be exposed to this great world. Y yeah, you may be, but you shouldn't have to walk through hell to get there. Right. That's not in any of our charters. Right. It's not what any of the founders did it for. 
And so no matter what organization you're in, if you're dealing with those things, yes, you go through it. And then the other thing is people don't understand that hazing is hazing. I'm certain that if, if we're honest about drinking, you know, think about people who died with 0.48, 0.45, 0.50, three nine blood alcohol levels mm -hmm. you know think about that and it you, you, i'm sure it was pitch oh what's just drinking we're just going to play a drinking game but if we're not honest that this so-called drinking game is going to take you to the brink of death then that creates a dynamic that students fall into the trap so it starts with a lie mm -hmm. and we have to really be candid that it starts with a lie and then with misunderstanding and then couple that that many universities aren't willing to talk about it soon enough to make a difference. And, and, and so a lot of my work with universities is I go in and, you know, I present uh, relevant case law, I discuss the university policies, any relevant state or federal, or uh, not federal, but any state laws, legal precedent and all that stuff to talk about risk and dangers of hazing. And so as we examine and as we explore that, you know, I'm baffled at how many students are like, oh yeah, well, you know, I, I heard of, you know, Tim Piazza. I heard of Max Gruvar. I heard of, um, you know, I, I heard of some of the, the, these other cases. And so as we think about that, then it's like, well, why would you repeat that same behavior? Oh, well, you know, th that, that doesn't apply to me. You know, that, that's not gonna happen to me. And I think that those are the things, those are the undercurrent that we have to really get into and unpack. If we look at the, the case with uh, New Mexico State, and um, this was Kappa Sigma, mm -hmm. and Jonathan, Jonathan uh, Silas, a pledge, was literally shot in the leg, shot in the leg by a student named Miguel um, Altamirano, and this was in a November, November 2019 hazing ritual for loyalty oath. So I did a little homework and found out this chap has been doing this loyalty oath for decades. Wow. And, and so in this loyalty oath, at least in, in, in what I found, in this loyalty oath, it, it's you, you put a gun to the person's head and make them do a loyalty oath to Kappa Sigma. I'm pretty confident that in 1869, that's not what the founders of Kappa Sigma thought of, no. right? But you make these chapter traditions bigger than the very fraternity or sorority. Mm -hmm. And you you tell them going back to my example earlier you get the respect of of these predatory people who come back in haze you get the respect of this little group of 21 year olds who are just wielding power and violence so students fall into it because they want to belong and they're promised a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow but then when when you when you really look around you're not going over the rainbow, you're going through purgatory, you're going through hell, you're going through the nightmare forest. Mm -hmm. And so we have to start by having early and honest conversations and the organizations have to hold each other accountable. That's why one of my other recommendations is around peer education mm -hmm. and um, doing a peer to peer bystander intervention because we have to check each other and we have to be strong enough to check each other. You know, and, and if we want it to stop, we have to stop it ourselves. We can't expect nationals to do it for us. Nationals can only see so far. Right. You know, by precedent, the universities have a responsibility to educate. And that's what I do is I talk with students about, we make sure you meet your standard to educate. So if they do it anyway, at least you can win in court. Mm -hmm. hmm. I mean, I, I love your answer. Early and honest communication, I think is absolutely the key. And when you look at, new members that leave their organization, the number one reason why they leave is misaligned expectations. They were told X and then they got Y. And that's why they left the organization. And I think it's on all of us, all fraternities, all sororities. If I'm in one of your classes at Humboldt State University, I'm getting a syllabus on day one of what I'm going to be doing. And I have the option of leaving if I'm not down with whatever is in that syllabus. And so where is that for fraternity and sorority life? We have to create that syllabus that shows week by week exactly what we're gonna be working on in our new member education program. We hand that to the potential new member. This is exactly what we're gonna be working on over the next eight weeks. 
and, and then just have them sign it so everybody's on the same page, but it's early and honest communication. That's it. That's it. You're spot on. And, and so in doing that, we can create a dynamic where uh, a pledge or a hopeful or a prospective member isn't seen as a snitch. You know, th th there's a thing that, that I've observed with an MPHC in a couple of years, in the last few years, when they have their, their probate or their come out show, if someone drops line, you know, it, it used to be, when I joined in fall 98, if a person dropped line, you know, you, you didn't change the numbers. If you have six people on the line and, and the four drops, you just don't ever talk about four again. The line is just like one, two, three, five, six, and mm -hmm. you hope no one ever figures out what happens to four. Mm -hmm. But now these folks are so bold that they'll do it. If you have six people on the line and two drops, They'll do one, they'll put a box where two is, like, you know, and write like these horrible, shameful, degrading things on the box to indicate that, oh, you're weak. You're, there's something wrong with you because you didn't submit to this foolishness and the violence and the hegemonic dominance. Someone has become that emboldened that we will publicly shame. It used to be a fear. That oh well, if the person dropped line, we we we, we gotta keep them from. We don't we don't want them to sue. We we, we want them to be okay. We, we we want it to go away. Well now, it's just, it's public degradation, mm -hmm. and you you and, and then you're seeing the same things in IFC. You're seeing it in in MPC. You're seeing it in multicultural groups, and that's where it, it's it's really way out of control. Yeah, and and so we have to be able to wind that back a really long ways. Yeah, I 100% agree with you. I mean, you know, I meet members of my fraternity almost every single week, uh, people from all over the country. I joined my organization in New York. Maybe I'm meeting somebody in California. Maybe they are just joining the organization now. So meaning they're 25 years younger than me, or maybe they're 25 years older than me. But at the end of the day, you know, I don't ask them to come and clean my house to prove to me that they're a brother. I don't ask them to drink this fifth of alcohol in order to prove to me that you're really my brother. All you have to do is live your life in line mm -hmm. with the values of the organization and you mm -hmm. are my brother and i think we've mm -hmm. lost sight of that and now mm -hmm. it's all about these trials and tribulations which have nothing to do with the committing yourself to the values of the organization and living your life in line with the founders that came before us it's just that simple spot on spot it's on simple so, all right, so here, let's talk about a couple of cases because I know you're really familiar with some of these cases. The, um, the first one is Knoll versus Board of Regents of the University of Nebraska in 1999. That mm -hmm. set the stage for university liability when the university had previous knowledge of hazing going on. They had knowledge of hazing in the chapter that actually had the injury to the student and future acts were foreseeable by the university based on prior behavior that they had documented. So mm -hmm. are universities now taking a different approach since that case in 1999? <laughs> That's an interesting question. Um, well, we would hope so. Um, I think some are and I think others have work to do. Mm -hmm. um, it, it has to be collaborative. What, what often happens is there's a blame game. The, the, the nationals blame the university, the universities, you know, blame the nationals and, and, and we all blame the, the person who perpetuated the act, person or persons who perpetuated the acts. Mm -hmm. So the, the real interesting part about this case is, so what happened was there was a Phi Gamma Delta pledge uh, who was handcuffed, he was drunk, he was um, um, taken into a bathroom and handcuffed to a, a old water heater or something like that, or a radiator. Mm -hmm. And it was like on the second or third floor of the res hall and he, he trying to get loose, he fell out of a window and he sued. So what happened was there, there were a couple of things that were out there with this case, it's really important. So number one, in the lower court, they actually dismissed the case, but then there's always the appeal. So the Supreme Court said the university could be liable for a few things. Number one, there was previous knowledge of campus hazing. So that means that some or any organization had been in trouble or had been found responsible for hazing. 
So it starts there, okay? Mm -hmm. Two, this particular chapter had had issues of hazing in the past as well. Based on those two factors, essentially what the court said was acts of hazing are reasonably, for, reasonably foreseeable. More importantly, in the simple nomenclature, you should have known. You should have saw this coming. And so what this particular case tells universities is if you've had someone who's had issues in the past, you're on the hook if you go to court. Mm -hmm. And so I really use that to unpack with, with uh, campuses how to measure that. So who often has the fraternity and sorority life jobs? You, you get a grad student who's maybe 24, 25 years old. They, they get the FSL job and, and you know, they're, they're right out of grad school. Maybe they've been in RD for a couple of years. Maybe they've had a grad coordinator, a coordinator job in the Greek life office. So then you say to them, you're responsible for Greek life. Now, I believe that if they have the passion and the interest and the training, they should absolutely be in that job. But here's how a lot of schools fail them. You give this student who often comes from another university, sometimes they're from within, but they often come from another university because most schools want to hire someone with a little distance from local chapters, right? Okay, so you hire this person and then you give them no records. You, you, you don't say, well, you know, there, there's maybe lore, there's maybe some anecdote, you know, if, if you're fortunate and you've got, you know, a long-term VP or a long-term dean of students who has some institutional knowledge, you're helpful. But oftentimes the biggest challenge that I find for people who take these jobs out of love and altruism, who are willing to take on all this risk, and I commend them. I'm not knocking them, I'm commending them. Mm -hmm. But we disempower them when we don't give them records of real history. Right. The files are missing. Oh, well, you know, I, I think a couple of deans ago, these folks got in trouble, but we don't remember, but everyone graduated. Or if it made national news, they, they find their answers on Google. Universities don't always do the best job of keeping real records, which opens us up to reasonable foresight. But you better believe in discovery that lawyer is going to come with it all sure. during the lawsuit. Yep. And so uh, what, we, what I really unpack in, in the particular chapter that I wrote that you're talking, and this is my thing. A lot of people do different things in Greek life, and I think there's room for all of us. My stuff is the case law. That, 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 that's, that's my space in this world. I really enjoy doing this work. Because when you work with these folks in Greek life, the first thing you say, I was doing a presentation, uh, maybe at, I don't know, I was at some, some conference doing, doing, this, doing something on case law and liability. Mm -hmm. And I said, how many Greek life professionals are in the room? And everyone, you know, probably half the room, maybe three-fourths of the room raised their hand. I said, okay, how many of you have been in your job for less than three years? Well, uh, probably about 90% of them raised their hand. Right. And I said, how many of y'all came in and someone handed you a box of records with a clear history of all the hazing and conduct issues on your campus for the last 20 years? Nope. Literally, I got one hand and I remember that person. And they don't, <laughs> and the thing about it is that person was from, um, was from uh i think michigan and i think michigan had like a greek life director that, that retired recently that had been there for like 25 years in the job right? right so my point in that to say is those that's the way we set ourselves up to fail on issues of reasonable mm -hmm. foresight yeah that and so then take that to the dishonesty that we talked about from the members in the earlier part of this conversation and so we're really setting up at risk. So our university is doing it better. Yeah, I'll, I'll use Youngtown, Youngstown State an example. Um, Youngstown State is an example. Eddie Howard, their VP of students up there. I, I did some work with them a couple of years ago. And Dr. Howard, newly mentioned Dr. Howard, went to work and put together a really robust history of what had happened with fraternities and sororities on this campus mm -hmm. and really empowered his team to be successful to address this. So you're already, but if you're doing that work and it's exacerbated by not having records, it's really dangerous. So universities have to put resources into this. You know, Greek life chapters barely have a lot of money. The chapters usually have their own money or they're having to go get student activity fees and stuff like that. Even the wealthy schools with huge Greek life programs, Greek life offices don't often have a lot of money. Right. So 
I almost believe the same thing that happens with registrar's offices. Like my registrar just went through, like Clint just went through like 50 years or 70 years of records and moved everything digital. We've got to do the same sort of thing with Greek life so we can easily know this stuff. So we're, we're in trouble there. And I, I know, I'm not going on about this but i really nerd out on this stuff but we can't address reasonable foresight if we haven't even kept good records or invested the time in keeping good records so we set our our, our good really good young professionals up to fail right there yeah in, in defense of the universities i do think we're starting to get better in terms of getting this all on digital records and then starting to display that on websites on fsl pages mm -hmm. so i think we're getting better but i agree mm -hmm. with you i think that we still have a lot of room for improvement there's no question oh yeah i'm with you there i'm with you there and and, and don't get me wrong i work at the school i yeah. work at the school i work at the university i get my paycheck from the university i yes. definitely want to see us continue to do better I, I i just think that that oftentimes there's not a lot of work that's put into it until there's an emergency Right. And and my point and what I talk about in the book is we have to do these things before the crisis hits. Right. We've got great people who work in Greek life. Um, I am so impressed. You know, I, I look at Josh Brown at Texas A&M. He was in South Florida for a long time. You know, if, if every Greek life professional could have the, 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 the patience and the thoughtfulness and the wisdom and the willing to stick with it and dig through and really work with these young people the way Josh does. And there are plenty of others I can name like that, but, but in, and I use Josh because he wrote a chapter in the book, but I've watched him do this work. You know, we met at AFLV a long time ago and had a great conversation. We came to one of my sessions and we kept in touch over the years. And I've watched what he's done. And that's the model, the work that he did in South Florida and the work that he's building at Texas A&M. That's the model. But it really is about seeing more universities replicate that type of work. Um, you know, I'm in the National Concern Journey and Sorority page, and I'm just impressed every day at the sharing of resources and the way people support each other. Mm -hmm. But what we have to do in that group is how do we normalize the positive behavior in that group so that the rest of campuses keep up? So again, I think there's great work going on among Greek life, Greek life professionals, but I think the universities have to prioritize it. And this is what Walter Kimbrough talks about. He actually encourages presidents, it's unusual, but go to an AFA conference. Yes. Spend time with your Greek life professionals and listen to them about what's going on. Put resources there and yes. don't wait until it's time for a lawsuit because then legal counsel driving the bus anyway. Right. And so that's what we have to do as a university. And, that, and, that, and that's where my critique remains pretty firm. So thank you for allowing me to clear that up. It's not a critique of Greek life professionals at all. Right. It's right. a critique of the system that doesn't support them as well as they could. Is it getting better? Absolutely. But do we have a long, long way to go? Absolutely. Right. I mean, all right, that's really good. The other case I wanted to talk to you about, it was Kenner versus Kappa Alpha Psi fraternity in 2002. In that case, mm -hmm. the chapter advisor was solely held responsible based on his failure to discuss hazing and oversee the university's policies on hazing. So do you see this case as a deterrent for more alumni to step forward in an advisory role because they don't want to get caught up in the liability? Actually, I see it the other way. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. I was in a school in New York uh, a couple of years ago, and I was conducting some hazing training with them, with, with the advisors. And actually, I did the advisors, and then I did all the coaches, and then I did the students in the evening. So, so the session with the coaches, I go through this case. And I, I showed a slide where we went through this case. And I have, like, advisor highlighted in big and bold. So the background on this case is um, it was the University of Pittsburgh. And a member of Kappa, it was post-mortorium, was paddled a couple hundred times. He was given cane. He had renal failure, seizures, hypertension, and PTSD after the fact. So the lawsuit was against Kappa. It was against the local chapter members and multiple members of the university. In the lower court, in the appellate court, what they did was they ruled in favor of the defendants and they dropped the case against the university, against the individuals, against Kappa Alpha Psi. The only person left on the hook was the advisor for the two reasons you mentioned. Number one, they didn't read executive orders and they never met with local chapter members to discuss Hazel. Right. 
Now, when I did this, we talked about this in New York, and I replaced this advisor slide, and I said, so change advisor to coach. So I noticed there's a coach who's, like, on his phone, and he's kind of bristling, and I'm thinking, oh, have I made this person mad? Like, what's happening here? So after the session, he comes up to me, and he says, uh, hey, uh, Dr. Merriweather, I, I, I need to hang, hang with you for a second. Do you, do you have anything to do right now? So I've got about 20 minutes before my next session. He says, oh, oh well, I, I had all my team leave class and <laughs> leave, leave practice and come to campus. I had all my team come in here to talk with you and to go over the, 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 the rules about hazing with, with you while, while we're here. And I was like, well, sure, we, we can do it. And he said, and then I can bring them back tonight because as a coach, he realized he'd never done that. Mm -hmm. What I found talking about this case does on campuses is it helps advisors understand that their job isn't just to sign the paperwork. Their job isn't just to uh, show up at the party or, or something like that, but that their job is to educate. And I've actually found the opposite of the effect that you described. I haven't seen it scare people off. Mm -hmm. I've seen it influence people who really care, who really, really care about these organizations. And most of all, they care about the students and the people. And I've seen university advisors and campus advisors and alumni advisors and grad chapter advisors respond by saying, wow, if this is what it takes, it's what I'm going to do. So I've seen it have a much more positive than chilling effect. Um, in fact, what I can tell you, Michael, I was at, um, I was at uh, a university recently. Uh, where was I? I was actually at Hofstra University doing some work with them recently. And no, 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 that was a couple years ago. Wrong school, wrong school. I was at Eastern Connecticut University recently. And when I went through, went through this with them, I had a number of the staff come up and talk to me afterward and say, hey, um, I'd like to be able to follow up with you. I'd like to be able to do some work with you on how to develop this type of session uh, for my students. What do I need to talk about? And I was blown away at how many followed up, how many emailed and, and really said, you know, this is what I'm doing. I'm glad to have that conversation with you. So I didn't see it as a scaring effect. I saw it as a wake up call to say, hey, there's an opportunity for me to do more to help students and save lives. And I think that's what we'll continue to see with our advisors. But again, we have to get this information in their hands. Right. I'm happy to hear that. I'm very, very happy to hear that. I also want to know more about the Meriwether education, Educative Hazing Prevention Model and your pre-membership strategy. Talk to us a little bit about the four aspects to this model you developed. Thank you for that. Um, so again, th this comes from years of experience doing this. As I said, I I've been doing this work for a long time, working with campuses, and this really came from my dissertation. Mm -hmm. And I've adapted it a bit over the years um, from my dissertation was on, um, uh, well, there's a long title for it, but essentially it was on what makes students report or don't report hazing or not or fail to report hazing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, you look up the pretty title later. <laughs> but anyway, my point in that to say is that as we examined intent to report in my dissertation study and I looked at hazing, I found a couple of things. Um, around what makes students believe something is or is not hazing, and also some significant findings of, and differences among gender, race, um, uh, officer role in the organization, uh, things like that, that really had an impact on who was or was not likely to report hazing, and I use the theory of reason action to do it. And taking that with a lot of the case law work I've done over the years, it became clear to me that so many universities are doing it different ways that there needs to be a clear standard for who's involved and how you involve them and when you have um, sort of engagement around hazing. So in the pre-membership education aspect, I start with new student and parent programs. Mm -hmm. as, as I said earlier, universities have to take on the responsibility early and often to talk about hazing and to not be afraid to do it during orientation. I know there's so much happening and we're really, really busy. Uh, my Dean of Students has just implemented this at Humboldt. I've, I've done it at other universities where I've been as well. I've seen other universities implement this. And it's really robust when we talk about it during orientation and with parents, because they often don't know the signs either. Right. And then before this, the second step is before there's a problem, we need to be friends with local, regional, and national officers from Greek letter organizations. 
We need to talk to them. We need to, it doesn't only need to be in the crisis. So when we're upset or we're trying to figure out liability or we're trying to figure out who's in the hospital and why, those relationships should exist early. And they should be genuine and the rapport should be authentic and we have to stay in touch. When I was a dean of students a long, long time ago, I, I made it my business. I think before I even met with the student government, I made it my business to reach out to the, the representatives, either the consultants or the, the grad chapter folks from all of the, G, the Greek letter organizations on my campus. Um, my dean uh, does the same thing. Ebony does the exact same thing now. Mm -hmm. And so having that engagement is really important. But the other thing is getting together to build up an advisor training, which is the third thing, and a certification for the people who are advising the students. And we have to do that together. It can't be we, they. So before we even think about having intake or rush or, or bringing in new members, we have to get those things clear before that begins. You know, the train can't be halfway down the track and we're trying to build the track. Right. And so doing that early is really important. It's coming up with some clarity about the roles of the advisor and coming up with a joint certification for the advisor. And so we've been uh, doing this at Humboldt um, in the last year and our Dean has been building that up as well there. And then getting an educative policy session to review state law, university law or university policy and any relevant uh, legal precedent and to do it together. So on my campus now, you cannot have rush. You cannot have MIP. You can't do anything if there's not a sit down with a representative from nationals, with the representative from local grad chapter if needed, from the advisor, the consultant, whoever, with the on-campus advisor, with the current members, and with the expiring member, aspiring members. We have to all be in the room at one time. Mm -hmm. Langston University does this. A uh, really great model at Langston um, for, for how they do that. And uh, their pres, Ken Smith, and um, their dean, Josh Busby, put that together. And, and every aspiring member, and um, I actually think that they're going to evolve it. I think all their first-year students just have to learn about it, <laughs> whether they want to be Greek or not. I think they're going to evolve it a bit. But I'm saying that to say you get everyone in a room and you talk about it and you, you unpack the risks and the dangers and the harms of hazing and you do so in a really honest way. We're not trying to dissuade people from being in a fraternity or sorority. I love Alpha Phi Alpha. Sure. I'm not one of those who's disgruntled because I, no, I was haze, but I'm not one of those that was disgruntled because I had a bad, bad experience. Um, it's not like that for me. It goes back to where we began the conversation. I wanna save lives. Right. So we're not trying to dissuade you from being Greek by doing these things. We're trying to make sure that you join an organization and do it the right way. And I've seen universities really embrace this in really positive, positive, positive ways. Um, and, and it has a, a really positive effect. And then on the back end, once folks are in, you start the process over. You keep the engagement with regional and national officers. Then this is where I talk about um, implementing a Greek council, sort of a, a, a peer education model, where we create accountability among the, the fraternity and sorority members. And again, keeping the advisors engaged and having advisors involved in preventative education, again, not just signing paperwork for events. And then once again, you host this educative system where you keep the current members engaged with future members. Everyone in the room at one time, Right now we're in COVID world, so maybe everyone in the Zoom at one time. But if you don't go through that process, you cannot join an organization. If you don't go, if you don't go through that process, you can't host or invite or intake new members. Keep it firm. And there are universities who are doing things like this. I just wanted to put it into a consistent model with the effective practices that I think are preventative in nature um, to help slow hazing, to chill it, but also to create an environment where we're okay talking to each other about it. Right. The root of this engaged model is the engagement. It's the communication. It's keeping the right people talking. I think that, uh, and you know, cause you've led a national organization. Well, how many times do you know when you get, did you know when you, when you received the call from the university, you knew the blame game was coming, right? 
Sure. Everyone's in protection mode. But if you've actually worked together and had a relationship, because trust me, the students are smart enough to see this too. Right. They hear, they hear the whispers, they, they know what we say. And so if we work together and we create a dynamic where the, the students can't even get around the relationship between nationals and advisors in the university, it becomes harder for them to perpetuate acts of hazing. Right. Yeah, being proactive is key, and that's something that I really believed in as executive director. I know I was out there on the front lines talking about hazing prevention in advance of a problem. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't want to wait for somebody to get hurt in order to talk about these issues because I knew that the possibility was there. So I agree with you completely. I love that model of getting everybody together in one room, and we should be repeating that process every six months because we have new people coming in every six right. months, and they're bringing their experiences from the high school basketball team or the high school swim team or wherever the boy scouts whatever it is and they're bringing that into our fraternities and sororities on college campuses um, so you know one final question about this hazing um, to end hazing you contend in the book that student affairs leaders must engage in proactive anti-hazing education that empowers members of the campus community to take action and report unsafe activities. And if we look at the tragic Timothy Piazza case at Penn State, this is sometimes a difficult thing for students to do. So how can we get students to get over this fear of getting in trouble and instead save a life? Oh, wow, that's powerful. I really appreciate that question. And I'm about to nerd out on you with my answer. Okay, I'm warning you now. All right. In reality, before Timothy Piazza, which was horrible, Horrible death. Should not have happened. But before that, nearly the same thing happened with Michael Ding at Baruch College. Right. Where, where, where they left him. Right. And, and, and you hear this report from the coroner, had they just called the police, I think both people would be alive today. Had they just called an ambulance. I think Michael Ding and Tim Piazza would both be alive today. When these people who were supposed to be their brothers one day chose to recklessly and negligently ignore the 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 violence and, and what had happened and, and and even though with tim piazza you know it was alcohol consumption that's still violence we have to be honest about that it's still violence and so i i think back to your question gosh i i think what i worry about what really keeps me up at night is that people won't feel that there's a space for them to report. So universities have to create models where you can email, you can call, even you can text if you want to, you can stop by the office. But that starts with knowing the Greek life folks earlier, knowing the dean, the VP, knowing you can talk to a faculty member early it's really important because if your whole world has been constructed on campus around the norms and traditions and mores, be they twisted or not, within the hazing culture of a fraternity and sorority, well, guess what? University leaders, they seem like outsiders you don't want to talk to them. So we have to be present early right. to make reporting seem to be a viable option. Mm -hmm. And then if, if you look at, uh, I'll, I'll go back to Penn State. Um, when Isaiah Humphreys filed his federal lawsuit against the football team, who was the NFL player? Um, uh, there, there was an NFL player who was a former um, – I uh, don't have the name in front of me. There was a former NFL player who went, like, on Twitter and, like, blasted Isaiah Humphreys for reporting it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, and so, again, there's this pressure. And so that's where the peer education model becomes so important. That's where it's really important to have this bystander intervention training and um, to go in and to build off that bystander intervention training to really adapt it for what happens in the Greek life houses, for what happens at these off-campus parties, for what happens if we decide to take folks out into the woods. And so if we create that kind of model where students are challenging other students if one other person speaks up, uh, and, and I'm building off of uh, research by Alan Berkowitz, mm -hmm. but if one person speaks up 
the likelihood, and I talked about this in my dissertation too, the likelihood that others will say, yeah, maybe we, we need to stop this. Maybe we shouldn't do this. But we have to create a dynamic where that other person speaks up. And that's those honest conversations, adapting peer intervention um, for campus. It's really important that we build those kind of spaces where the students feel safe to challenge each other, but they also feel safe to talk to us as university leaders. Right. So it's really, really important that we do that. And, and so I, I guess what I'm saying is that it goes back to your question, why do people still allow themselves to be hazed? Um, I think that it goes back to this sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. This is Terrell Strayhorn's work um, mm -hmm. on sense of belonging. He has a really solid book from about 2012 on that. And, and I cite that in my dissertation, I cite it in the book too. Because if the belongingness is created in an unhealthy space, it is very difficult for us to come back and say, oh, well, this isn't normal. Because we as university leaders didn't interact quick enough and didn't have the support to interact. So I go back to Dr. Kimbrough's chapter, Walter Kimbrough's chapter, where, where university presidents have to help before the lawsuit. We have to put resources into fraternity and sorority life for education, um, for communication, we have to give them access and not only pay attention when the harm is done. There are universities who are doing it. You know, uh, my friend Lori Reeser at Wisconsin is, is doing some really good work up there to totally realign Greek life. Um, I'm really impressed with, 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 with what she's doing up there. And I think that we can do this work in some really positive and meaningful ways and allow Greek life to be what it's supposed to be. But we have to create models where students feel that normal is in fact normal. Mm -hmm. And that these toxic and dominant hegemonic systems of hazing, that those are the anomalies. Those are the outliers. But we've got to do it early because if we, it's just like with academic intervention, mm -hmm. you know, midterms, it's, it's too late. You know, we, we have to talk to students and know students. We have to catch it the first quiz. We have to catch if they're struggling in the second lecture on class. Right. You know, if you wait till midterms or, or the week before finals, it's often too late. Right. And so it, it, we have to be in this space early and talk about it. And we have to normalize the healthiness and, and the safety, and it goes back to that life versus tradition paradigm. I found that to be the most powerful tool that I use when I work with campuses, and we talk about that in the book. Um, it, it's really the grand theme, and in, in the, the final chapter, I really unpack that, to talk about this concept that we're really down to the value of life versus the value of tradition. And, and I try my best not to allow the conversation to be about anything else. We can talk around it. We can talk through it. But at the end of the day, what it comes back to is, so I understand you want to perpetuate these harms, but what about all the people who have died? Are you going to call someone's parent and say to them, well, you know, your, your kid is dead because they were weak. I got through it. You, you, they should have been able to, too. Are, are you the one who's going to walk away and, and leave someone in medical trauma, even though they were supposed to be your brother? This is about life. Are you going to, you know, try to mimic waterboarding and do some of these things that happen, even though they're supposed to be your sister? This is about life. And so that's what we bring it back to every time. We do all this to bring it back to that argument of life versus tradition. And hopefully that value for life will be what we call in spades, the big joker, that someone will be willing to play to stop this either as a peer or as an observer to report it to the university and to report it to nationals. And then if they have healthy relationships and they're working together, it's not a blame game. It's an actual resolution to save the lives of the people who pay our dues and our tuition, right? We say we love them, we say we care about them, we tell them this in letters and webinars and online and meetings and sessions. Well, it's time to show and prove. It's time to show and prove by working together and stopping the blame game 
and really building up this peer and bystander intervention stuff because it works. It's been proven to work in other areas. And that's where, where my dissertation research on the theory of reasoned action comes in. What is more likely to have an influence on stopping hazing? And what I found in my research was uh, social influencers. Social influencers. Which, what happens in your group? Hazing thrives in secrecy because you cut off. It's no different than domestic violence. You cut off all the other resources where you and the victim. Now, I'm not saying that to diminish dom domestic violence. I'm saying it to elevate how barbaric and brutal and hateful and hurtful hazing can be. So we have to work together to do it. It's communication. And so that's the basis of the model. And that's why that peer intervention work is so important. I 100% agree, not just in hazing, but just like to your point, sexual assault prevention, alcohol and drug abuse prevention, all of these things can be solved with really good bystander intervention and that peer accountability that you're suggesting, as well as the solid relationships with the administrators that you feel comfortable and empowered to go and report when you see these things happening in your chapter or on your campus in another organization for example. So you've given us so much to chew on today. I mean, this has just been so enlightening and I'll probably go back and watch this two or three times just to make sure that I've digested everything that we've talked about here today and I've internalized it and uh, feel comfortable moving forward and, and educating our students and all of these things that we talked about today. Um, and before we go, of course, you know, we love to eat good food here at Fraternity Foodie. So I need to know what is your favorite restaurant that is near campus at Humboldt State in California. So that way the next time I'm on campus, I know where to go to eat. <laughs> All right, so Michael, I have to tell you, I have been dying to answer this question, <laughs> even more than talking about the book. So have you ever seen SpongeBob SquarePants? Sure, of course. You're a parent, I know you have. I'm a parent. <laughs> so I didn't know until I moved to Humboldt County to Arcata that the, the creator of uh, SpongeBob SquarePants actually is an alum of Humboldt State. Okay. How crazy is that? That's crazy. And so okay. um, as an alum, he frequented a, a place on campus. His name was Steven Hillenberg. And I think he was a marine biology major and unfortunately he passed away, but his family is still very supportive of the university and we're really grateful to them. But Steven Hillenberg, who created SpongeBob, constantly ate at a restaurant called Stars in Arcata. It's a burger joint. Okay. Stars is rumored to be the foundation of the Krusty Krab. The building looks just like the Krusty Krab. <laughs> and <laughs> then they go another, online and research this so I can find the picture. <laughs> I, I kid you not. Go check it out. I, I, I will. Check it out. <laughs> and the food. <laughs> the burgers, now, now, it's not like a Spongebob-themed restaurant or anything like that, mm -hmm. but the burgers are magical. I don't know what they put in their burgers. I don't know what they put in their chili, but it's like magical food. But, but that's the local lore, is that when he created the Krusty Krab, it was created to reflect uh, um, the Star's burgers. Then my other favorite place is Ashley Seafood. So Ashley owns a seafood place. Her husband uh, owns a boat and they work together. So the husband catches the fresh crab and Ashley sells these Dungeness crab. And I mean, oh my, they're so amazing. So they do this smoked crab and I've never had smoked crab in my life. Like a whole Dungeness crab, they back them, they clean them and they'll smoke them for you. Those are my two favorite places to go when you come visit Humboldt County. But we have to have Stars Burgers. All right, we'll do both. That sounds absolutely delicious. As somebody who was raised in the Maryland area, going crabbing in Maryland and uh, eating some of those crabs over there, I, I can't wait. <laughs> I'm starved for seafood living here in Nashville. I really want seafood. I don't get it very often. So you better believe I'm going to hit both of those places up uh, as soon as I get out to your neck of the woods. Um, so this has been a lot of fun. This is really, really good. If our listeners have additional questions for you, or maybe they want to follow you on social media. Where do you recommend they go? Well, I'd be really honored uh, to, to get the connect on social. Um, obviously, I'm on LinkedIn at Jason L. Merriweather on LinkedIn. I think maybe Dr. Jason L. Merriweather or Jason L. Merriweather PhD or something like that. But I'm on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. um, 
And then on uh, Instagram, uh, you can find me at alpha PhD. And my email is uh, alpha PhD at yahoo.com. And my website is Jason L Um, there's a picture. I've, I've actually got to put a new picture up cause like I have hair now. Um, but there's a picture of bald Jason, um, on my website, of course, but Jason L And there you can click and go right to my email and my Instagram. Um, but I'd love to connect with you. I'm really Michael grateful to be on your show. I know you've got some awesome listeners and, and I already watched the podcast. And so getting the food question right was super important to me. Um, but please connect, email if I can be a service to support your campus. Uh, reach out. There are a lot of great people and a lot of great resources. But most of all, read the book. Uh, please check out the book. Um, uh, you can find it on Amazon or on the NASPA website. Uh, but please check out the book. There's some great resources. And I'm really humbled to work with some phenomenal people who really care about the topic and put some really practical resources. Uh, the other thing I want to mention real quick, too, in the book is the effective practice inserts in the book are written by people in the field who do this work every day with a range of people who are in Greek life, uh, vice presidents, faculty, uh, deans of students, people who focus every day. There's even stuff on assessment. Uh, one of the most awesome effective practice inserts is by Michael Freeman at Coppin State. Dr. Freeman is an experienced higher ed leader, and he writes about the investigation process. And even his theme in the investigation process is connecting and working with nationals and that you should know them before the investigation happens. It's really important. So check out those effective practice inserts, um, there's stuff for academic and, or I'm sorry, for faculty advisors and grad advisors, but a lot of real stuff, even Almeida Jacks, uh, retired VP from Clemson, talks about her process of, the, of implementing pre-hazing education. So this is a real book. This isn't a grad research paper, turn book. This is a book of people who really care about this work, who are really getting out there um, and trying to serve our campuses and trying to support our students. This is fantastic. You and your colleagues did a tremendous job. The name of the book is Dismantling Hazing and Greek Letter Organizations. Rush out, buy this book, read this book. It is absolutely incredible. This is Dr. Jason L. Merriweather. I am just so honored that you're here with our listeners. I'm so happy that we could elevate this conversation and get it in the hands of our listeners. So if you enjoyed this conversation with Jason, please like this post on social media. Please share this with other people that are interested in the topic of hazing. Go pick up the book. And Jason, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's so important to me that we document these conversations with people like you that are confronting hazing on college campuses all across the country. I want to document it. I want people to hear it in your words because that is so important for me that future generations are going to get to learn from you. So, uh, so thank you so thank much you. for being here. It really means a lot to me. Thank you, Michael, so much. And once again, shout out to my amazing contributing authors. I am proud of you all. Thanks, yes, Michael. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you so much to our listeners. We'll see you on the next episode of Fraternity Foodie. Bye for now.